What message are we relating to those that take the lives of black youth from among us? The police in question will be free in a matter of days. Is this justice or is it criminally just us? Hello, my sisters and brothers all over the world. I am Pastor Midi Collier of the More Like Christ Christian Fellowship Ministry, as well as founder and president of the Bible Study Telephone Prayer Line, Feed a Neighbor Ministry. It is so good to be back at you again, and I have for my guest today a return guest because he had so much to say that we didn't get around to before, and he is attorney. Lawrence Kennan, affectionately known as Larry Kennan. Hey, how Thank you doing? You. I'm so glad to have you back with us today. And uh, Reverend Bailey kind of insisted on it because of the things that we have going on in the city now. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking before and we got into some things that you did, even in the service with the civil rights discrimination mm -hmm. case that you had, you with your bold self went up against the commanding officer and won. And mm -hmm. it was all because of discrimination and that's what we're going through now in this city. Uh, you also had something to do with the case of John Burge, right? Yes, I did. Okay, now what's the relation? Can you see anything that's what's going on then, that's going on now with this case that we had last week? Absolutely. First of all, well, you got to recognize that our society works under an umbrella of racism mm -hmm. and hostility. Mm -hmm. So we're in a, host a society which is hostile to the whole black community. Okay. So when you don't understand why are they responding this way, it's because they're being hostile yes. in their general uh, philosophical direction toward the black community. Mm -hmm. With respect to Burge, back in those days, he had been, they say he had, well, he had come from the army actually, and he was using those kind of terror tactics to the black community. And there is a concept of the police department that they are at war with the black community. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that any time they look at a black person, they're looking at a hostile enemy. They don't approach him like another citizen where they can have, they can, uh, have negotiations, where they can calm down a situation. The way that they answer each problem is to kill them. Mm. Now, mm. policemen are supposed to take so the citizens into custody. Mm -hmm. But now that's antagonistic to the concept of killing them because if you kill a person, you're not thinking about taking him into custody. So <laughs> you have made the decision to look at the facts, look at the, the evidence, and then make a decision as to what his penalty should be mm -hmm. on the spot. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Jason Van Dyke was another more sophisticated level of uh, John Burge. Yes. Okay. The only difference between him and John Burge is that he used a gun and Burge used physical other things to beat people. So I heard you say something about they get out of the armed forces and they come in to the community and they go right to the police force. Now, lately we've heard of so many suicides in the police force, which shows that there's a problem there also. Don't you think so? Absolutely. The police in our society today are the weaker persons rather than the stronger persons. We came along as children thinking in terms of the knights in shining armor who were protecting the king. And the policeman is supposed to be that same kind of thing as a metaphor to the knights in those days. And the police is supposed to be the person in the shining armor to protect the government. Mm -hmm. And they're protecting the government against those forces in the community that are against the government. Mm -hmm. The police today seem to be the people who are against the government who, the government who are trying to have equal rights and uh, the community. So you expect the knight in shining armor to go up against the huge dragons with the fire and to have all the bravery and to overcome that. Mm -hmm. The policemen today see an unarmed black man who is not any kind of threat 
and they're saying how frightened they are. Mm -hmm. The knights of armor were not frightened against these big dra dragons, mm -hmm. and we're frightened as policemen today against a man who has a baseball bat, a pipe in his hand, or a knife, and we kill him. But you keep saying, man, we're talking about a child now that That's was right. killed, was murdered in that kind of way, and they are men. So I see a problem with them, with them committing suicide and everything. I heard them say they were going to get help for the police force in order that, away from the police department, mm -hmm. in order that they can get some help for themselves. Well, what about helping our people? Indeed. What about helping the young people? to do things so that they will stay off of them. We, our young people are not attacking them. Right. We're attacking each other. Mm -hmm. But them are, uh, let me go back, we keep hearing them say, let's have a, uh, a what is it, a kindness between the community and the police. Mm -hmm. Let's just cooperate and collaborate with the police. Mm -hmm. But they are the ones who are doing the wrong. Right. So they need to begin to collaborate <laughs> oh, God, yes. against us, mm -hmm. not us against them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But our media are in a situation where they reverse all of the situations mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. to make and to demean the black community in favor of the police. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to come to some kind of real collaboration, we have got to have be responding to the over over request of the police rather than they responding to us. But when you go a step further though, our whole community is a hostile community. So they wonder why are the, the black people in our society antagonistic to the legal system. The legal system as you know started out as the establishment and as the establishment we had slavery, we have uh, Finally, the emancipation, we had the segregation period, and we've gotten up to where we are today, which is too far, not too far from the segregation period, except segregation was legal. So <laughs> we still have the same hostility. There's that same umbrella of racism under which the entire establishment operates. So we are engaged in a situation where we are the victims of the establishment directions. But, so does that look like they're actually, people are trying to take us back to that particular time, uh, rather th and we're not standing up to do anything about it ourselves? That's a little far than I would want to say, but they are in fact trying to get us back with this president oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. the establishment all right. the way down. Mm -hmm. But when I say it's a little far, because we are trying to do something about it ourselves. What? There are individuals who are working in small communities making these efforts. You got people like CPAC, you got the NAACP, you got PUSH. All of those people are uh, NAM. They're all trying to get an understanding in our community for the human rights of the black people. We don't have the actual legislation that says that black people don't have to be respected. But it's the operation, it's the engagement that the power structure has over us that puts them in a dominant position. The mm -hmm. reason we're getting so many people shot is that the police have an idea that they are the domination, dominating force of the community, mm -hmm. that they are going and responding to the meaner aspects of our society. Mm -hmm. So that since the society as a whole puts the black people into a second class uh, position, then the police officer says, well, I've got to enforce that position. And so they come against us as the enemy of our society. There's a thing that just came out not too recently about the black identity extremists. According to a leaked FBI document, there's a new group of domestic terrorists black identity extremists. Now, some of us believe that we are certainly black, have certainly a black identity. Mm -hmm. They have turned it around. The, the, uh, the uh, Justice Department 
had said that those people who are the black identity extremists are inimical to our white society. We have made a little advancement because when we came along, I'm a little older than you folks, but when I came along, you could not speak about race. No. That was a taboo society. Mm -hmm. So when you go back as a historical exploration, you don't see people saying, well, he was white and he was black, or so-and-so did this, he was a black person. In those days, they talked about race. We hardly talk about race today. Mm -hmm. We talk about he's a black man and we're proud of our blackness, but we don't say we're a black race all the time. Mm -hmm. So in the days that uh, we came along, you would find nothing that says that uh, the black race is a great race or a horrible race. You call it, when they used to say, oh, you're a uh, credit to your race, or you're uh -huh. a disgrace to your race. race uh -huh. Now, you haven't heard those, that very race. popular thought. Mm -hmm. Joe Lewis, for instance, was, oh, he was great for his race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anytime you said anything that was attack antagonistic to white folks, oh, you were a disgrace to your race. Mm -hmm. So we do need to get back to have, <clears throat> excuse me, pride in the race itself, in addition to pride in our individual selves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always look at myself as a black identity extremist too. I have the positive attitudes that because I think it's great for us to have a black to be extreme in our black identity. So you can call me a black identity extremist. That's what I want to be called, mm -hmm. and I'm against you guys who are trying to change the significance of that kind of identification. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I heard you talk about all the different groups and who came together to are doing something together. Now you were involved in the civil rights movement. Well, who, who all came together for Dr. King? I understand that there weren't but a few people, just a core few people that sat around a table to help with the civil rights movement and it became a big thing everywhere. So why does it have to be now all these groups together when you got wise mi minds, uh, some was mentioned here today, your mind, Reverend Bailey's mind, Reverend Sinclair's mind, Shinta's mind, all the, how come a group like that can't just get around the table and, and get things together the way the civil rights movement got together rather than all of these different groups that we can't even see moving? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Because the day we have the kind of technology which would enable right. us to actually pull it all together, right. and we didn't have in those days. Mm -hmm. But during, civil, during uh, Reverend Dr. King's period, there were more than just a few groups, a few mm -hmm. people because it expanded throughout the nation. Right, but I'm talking the about world. the beginning. They said that it only started with just this core group, a little group, maybe six or seven people sitting around a table. That's right. That was, you know, came to strategize. And the first thing that maybe we should look at is uh, economics, you know, and all our money. I heard somebody say, what if Oprah Winfrey and Beyonce and all of these folk with all this money would take all their money out of the white banks and put it in black banks and then see how that would start because everybody know money talks and that hurts people, you know. So what if somebody would get together and really be able to get through to us, all the people, even with my little money, to do what's supposed to be done, rather than us trying to get this group here and this group there and this group everywhere and nobody hears what they're saying like they used to. Well, we do have a voice in our society today. Okay. We don't have a single voice. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to say is what we need to do is get to have a single voice, mm -hmm. a core spirit. Mm -hmm. But we have so many black people who don't even like to say that they're black. Right. So that you have to have a common denominator to say that we are all in the same bag. Mm -hmm. So many people say, well, I don't want to be a, just because I'm black. I don't want them to try to speak for me. Mm -hmm. In the earlier days, when they recognized that they were hanging us and uh, lynching us all the time, people all were had the same amount of fear. Right. So we all got together as a protective level. Today, there are people now who have made it through certain paths Mm -hmm. So that they're in the suburbs and they are in politics and you get to be on a certain level 
you get further away from the man, the grass rich society. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the white people don't make that distinction. If you're black and you're a millionaire or you're black and you're a politician, when they catch a cop catches you out on that street, right. you're going to have exactly the same all as right. if you had no education at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So education is a great thing for a society which is neutral. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a society that's against anything of your own skin color, then education doesn't mean a thing to them. Mm -hmm. But it means a thing, a thing to us. So we should not detract from our goal to be highly educated. Right. But we should not think that because we are, uh, because we have more money, that that's going to save us in our own society today. Okay. And you mentioned that we're talking about the safety. Why we should really think in terms of economics. I don't think in terms of the economic first. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of uh, justice first. Mm -hmm. So I recall back in the movement days when they were saying, we shouldn't be marching, we ought to be trying to get money. Yes. And I thought about it and I re realized that in Atlanta, <coughs> Georgia, we had a lot of people who had a lot of money at that time. Mm -hmm they had to sit at the back of the bus. Right. So money didn't matter in this kind of hostile society. We should have people who do have the money, but unless we get the huge amounts of money so that we can run it ourselves, we, uh, it doesn't matter how much money that we've got if we can't control it. It's according to who has the power. That's right. There's another concept called the power elite, okay. which we are so far from it. Yes. That's a small core of people, which in today's society they say the num the one percenters. But those are the people who are in industry, railroads, gold mines, uh, international people who have billions of dollars. We're not talking about millionaires. We're talking about those who have so much money that that crowd of people don't have an address. They have the world is their world. They have their own private jets, their private trains, or anything that they want. And so they live in one country during this season, another country in another. And there are those uh, corporations that don't have America as its primary goal. America is just a part of their overall wealth. So there have been instances where people who uh, had an opportunity to either protect America or to protect their own interests, their primary interests were was themselves. Uh, Trump is a, a kind of a part of that. Mm -hmm. Trump does not live in a particular place. The really rich people don't have the kind of of uh, society or even worldview that the rest of us. And I'm talking about even the millionaires don't have. Mm. They don't think in terms of the health of this country or that country. They think of uh, if they have a mine in Africa or a mine in Venezuela, they think in terms of the wealth of that mine rather than how it's going to affect either the community there where it's located or America. Mm. Mm. So we have, when we talk about our needing to have money, our money if we have a nice large corporation doesn't even begin to take a pinch out of the real power elite the really rich folks who own the different corporations and the different airlines and all of those things because we don't own anything that's what you're we, trying to say we don't own it but so there are some we, people who have some money that we could own things but they're not together to help us to own things i agree so we, i'm i'm you know everywhere you look People want money. And when people, when doctors start going against, with doctors against patients, and I found that out for myself about the pharmaceutical companies, how mm -hmm. they work with the doctors to get money, to get me to pay for a prescription, $186 for eight pills. And when I can't pay for the eight pills with $186, well, go back to your doctor and ask, can you get something else as a substitute? And I get back to the doctor, and the doctor gives me two pills to take up for the one, and they only cost $14. What does that tell me? It lets mm -hmm. me know <laughs> that they are in it for the money. And not just the doctors, it seems like everybody is against everybody, and we are so much against ourselves. When we try to, uh, one person tries to go up, 
we snatch them down. So I think that some people in this city, all of them should be snatched down. And I don't mind saying the alderman because I don't get anybody to do anything over by my church. You know, the alderman trying to get them to do it, and they put it on somebody else. Well, that's Metro's fault. Well, Metro does not run on the street where the street's ragged. Get my street cleaned up, you know, let Metro do the tracks. So I'm trying to say everybody's in it for the money. So I think they should take all the aldermen out of office, all of them. Take them all out and replace them with some new minds. We got some young people who got some good minds. All of them not bad. All of them not out there doing things wrong. You got some people like that, so I think they should wipe the office clean because all we know how to do is grab at one another and try to keep others from getting it. I experienced that for myself, Larry. When I came over from the R&B field and went to the gospel field, I'm thinking that it's going to be all right. And when I'm in the, it, you know, when I'm in the R&B field, everybody there, you better sing night, tonight, midnight, pushing one another, saying, come on, do this. When I get to the gospel field, where well, I'm thinking people going to really be in my corner. They don't want to start talking about me. They didn't want to sing with me. They didn't want me on their program because I could sing, you know. And so they would start banning me for that and said I thought I was better than somebody. I'm thinking I'm supposed to be around church folk, folk that love the Lord. But the people out there in the world, those I was working with, Marvin Gale, Gladys Knight and all of them, they, they push one another. So I see more on that side than in the church. And you know everything happened in the church before. In the movement, mm -hmm. that's where everybody met, in the church. And everything got going in the church. Now you can't get nothing going in church because church all against the church. Well, church is trying to get money too. Yeah, well, I mean, okay. they're trying well, to get more than money. I want to be clear, though. When I'm saying that I'm not talking against the accomplishment of wealth. Okay. But I'm saying that our basic direction, our basic goal should be human rights. Okay. And then wealth. Not wealth and then human rights. Okay, so how do we get to that? That you have to start out recognizing part of your church, but it's according to having demanding of those who are in power to recognize the humanity, the humanitarian aspect rather than the profit motive. So we do that by the way that uh, push that uh, the churches, NAACP, we're all talking about human rights. Okay, so can we get the, this little group, just a little group of people, can we get them together to go to push, go to the other organization, sit down to get them to do what you just talked about doing? You know that there have been little groups who have tried that already. And what happened? It just never really expanded. That's broadly okay. Enough. Now we're back but to what I'm talking about. It's a matter of communication, too. Yeah. But remember I said there are people who have different view of their black identity. Mm -hmm. So we, before integration, we were all at the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. So there was nowhere else to go but just to go up. But now that there's people who are already out of that barrel, mm -hmm. then they don't necessarily agree with what those who are in the barrel are thinking. So that's why it's more difficult to get the, the horizontal aspect of it together. We can address the same issues but the tactics are in different levels. So that's why it's hard to get that one, that small core group together. So we're not gonna ever, we're not gonna ever change? Yes. We're not gonna ever learn we, from the past experiences? Uh, it should have been learned. I heard a man say, if I had, I'm black, if I had shot a white young man, it wouldn't even been a trial. Right. You know, so this thing is upside down, That's but we're point. allowing it to be upside down. So we got to start where you said with the human rights. We got to start somewhere, but how do we get started? How? I have had contradictions with some of my good friends about how to get to that point. What I suggest is that at three years old, we need to be teaching our young children who we are, our black identity, and where we relate in the overall community. Mm -hmm. If we started giving, I was just at a group the other day, or listening, where they were asking, at what age should we begin teaching our children about slavery? And there was such Way a back. difference about that. Really? Some said, well, before they get to high school. 
Oh, goodness. That's yeah. too long. Well, yeah, that is true before you get to high school. Mm -hmm. But it should be not only that before you get to grammar school. Right. They say, well, don't tell them that before they're able to understand. So you got to wait until they're able to understand. Well, they won't That's understand crazy. if you don't produce it to them right. before they understand. Mm -hmm. So I believe in education generally in order to get to those areas beyond your comfort level mm -hmm. so that you are introduced to it, it's a new concept, and each one is a step in learning. So I think <laughs> that's the importance should, of the family too. That's because the family. When, when I was little, we'd sit around and eat and we used to look at right in my grandmama's mouth, you know, as she was talking and everything. They don't do that anymore. You can't mm -hmm. even get a, people to sit down to have dinner together anymore. They all, this one in this TV room, this one in this room with their TV, this one in there with their plate. And so, we get, but we got to start somewhere. Uh, that's why I'm wanting to know how, how are we going to do this? But see, it's our concept. I know that most of the people who are listening to this are aware that when they were children, the parents would say, well, uh, don't stay in here. We're talking grown-up stuff. You mm -hmm. guys go out of the room, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that means that the young kids don't know the same thing you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They didn't get that generally. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the far reaches of the country where there was nothing else, you all talked about the same thing. But as we got to be urbanized, we said, get out of the room because you're talking adults. So you would do that and you got to be, that's when you're five, 10 years old. You get to be 11 or 12, you're still, you're then after they've told you to get out of the room, you go back to your own group and you get your own information and your own culture. Mm -hmm. And you get to be all the way up until 20 years old, you've been told to stay out of the room while the grown-ups are talking. Mm -hmm. You get to be around 20, then you're becoming grown, and so it's a kind of sometimes in and sometimes out. Mm -hmm. But your realism, your reality, is that same reality with the group who were at 10 and five when you were first told to stay out. Mm -hmm. So then by the time you're 26 or seven, now you're married, you've got a kid, and you're telling your kid you stay out of the room until uh, you get older. But what happens is you have lost an entire body of knowledge because your parents have now died, and that culture has not been developed in that group so that your adult culture is the same culture that you had when you were five without the benefit of your parents' culture. Mm -hmm. So you have missed it. Mm -hmm. If your parents began to talk about at three years old, as the Jewish people do, or five, mm -hmm. then you know what your whole uh, community, your whole society is about. And what you want is justice, mm -hmm. fairness and justice. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get that regardless of anything else, you're not a full citizen or not your, your, your human potential has not been developed. Well, a lot of times, well, since the babies are having babies now, and they, mm -hmm. don't, they don't know anything to teach because they haven't sat down to, to listen to anything, and they don't know anything. Now, I just heard the other day where it was a young lady on my Bible study telephone prayer line whose son, grandson, two grandsons, were snatched out of the car by the policemen because they were looking for two foil fellas with shotguns. Yeah. These boys didn't have any kind of shotgun. They brought up in church, go to church, all they had been to the hospital to see their mother. And they snatched them out, put them on the ground like they were monsters, put their feet all on their backs and everything. And this woman got to get out of the hospital, the grandmother, to go to try and find some money so she can try to get them out of jail. They didn't know they knew what to do because their mother is in the system. You know, she's a policeman. So she's already taught them to be whatever they tell you to do, do it. So if they're going to do what you tell them to do, why in the world would you throw them on the ground? That's our criminal justice system. And the criminal justice system is racist from the court all the way down to the policeman on the corner. Mm -hmm. And they suggest that the policeman cannot be wrong. And so they back up the police department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The police are racists, and it's a nepotism thing where usually your average young cop has a grandfather who was a policeman, a father who was a policeman, and he's a policeman. Mm -hmm. So they come up in the police culture, which says that the blacks are all 
thieves and thugs and so forth. Right. So they get out there and they're afraid of the black people because they figure that black folks are not trying to enhance the society that their grandfathers came with. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they come out there against us when they first start out mm -hmm. and they, are, uh, they go along with an older cop along the way. So all they learn is a police culture. Mm -hmm. And in our society, there is a police culture. Mm -hmm. That's a great, significant part of the criminal justice system. We are the, the uh, victims of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. whereas there's two systems, as you keep hearing, the south side and the north, and the north side are two different kinds of uh, education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't shoot white people because you see he may have a gun. Mm -hmm. Yet they treat us because they may think he might have a gun. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our problem is if you start us out early enough so that we are really thinking black first and we are able to get to that core group you're talking about to spread around, mm -hmm. you're talking long range. There's long range and short range. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to do the short range too, but that has to be based on the long range concept. Mm -hmm. And if you can get your young children to know who they are, to know what the history is mm -hmm. and to know the importance of education, they won't be dropping out and those who drop out are more inclined to shoot somebody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all of that. I'm still going to, we're going to still try to figure out how, okay, <laughs> because we got all, all the background, but we still got to come together some kind of way to get mm -hmm. this thing started and yeah. all of it. You know, the government that shut down, government was established by God in the first place. So I always say, as the Bible said, put the government back on the shoulders of God where it belongs, and then everything will be all right, because he does demand that the judges be just in their ruling, just in their righteousness, just in everything that they do. That's part of the law. You know it because you're a lawyer. You all have to learn the law. So that's part of it. But they are not just. And it's been, been that way all the time, down through the ages. So we got to start at the top somewhere and do what's, what's right. One little thing about the Bible that I always get back to is that God helps him who helps himself. Right. I think. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for just tuning in with us and come by 80201 South Dobson whenever you can. Coming in Chicago, uh, we'll be there. God bless you and remember that I love you to pieces. What message are we relating to those that take the lives of black youth from among us? Police in question will be free in a matter of days. Is this justice or is it criminally just us?